Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining in. Today is the last day of the 25th Popley Memorial Lecture Series, and I warmly welcome Professor Chandan Das Gupta for today's lectures. The instructions for the lectures will be comments or asking any question, unless the speaker permits or asks to do so. Today, and uh, when I ask the students about, you know, what are the, what are the topics that they you know, would be interested in, uh, then uh, this was suggested as one of the things that uh, the students uh, would like to hear uh, something about. So the last lecture, I'll be discussing the basics of the statistical mechanics of disordered systems. Now, I should point out that although, I mean, you know, this topic sounds a little different from what I was discussing earlier, uh, it's actually in the same uh, general class in the sense that now, again, we'll be talking about today uh, various cooperative phenomena, uh, phase transitions and things like that, but in a special class of systems, which I'll call disordered systems. So <clears throat> it certainly falls into the same category as uh, looking at interesting phenomena that uh, arise because of uh, you have a large number of interacting degrees of freedom. So in that sense, it is uh, very similar to what I was discussing earlier, but uh, the particular topics or the systems that will be concerned uh, with in this lecture will be what I call disordered systems. <clears throat> So, of course, I mean, you know, uh, this subject is not, uh, you know, particularly popular in the sort of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the curriculum. So, I mean, uh, the courses that one takes, uh, one doesn't really talk some, uh, a lot about uh, this kind of systems. It's different parts, then in this disordered system. So uh, I define order as either transitional invariant or periodic. These systems will not have these properties, that they will not be transitional invariant or they will not be periodic. So when I say that uh, the system, what we, we are referring to here is uh, some kind of uh, equilibrium state, some dynamic state of the system. So to, uh, what I mean by disordered uh, in, this, in this particular context, uh, again, when it goes back, to uh, in one of the lectures that I gave uh, a couple of days ago, uh, where you have, I mean, this is a standard transition where you cool a liquid and it becomes a crystalline solid. Now, when we are discussing that, we sort of said that the liquid state is disordered and the solid state is ordered. But uh, it's not, uh, <clears throat> one has to understand that one is talking about not a particular configuration of the particles that you have in the system, but some kind of a thermodynamic state. Uh, where, of course, I mean, you know that the system is going through a very large number of different microscopic states as the system evolves in time. And what you see or what you measure is basically an average over all these different microscopic states with a certain probability. And in the liquid state, if you do that, uh, then <clears throat> what you get is that uh, the liquid state looks homogeneous in the sense that uh, uh, average local density is the same at all points except of course near the boundary, but we'll not be concerned with that. We'll be looking at the bulk. So the liquid state is ordered in this sense that uh, if I want to look at this average property, average uh, local density, number density, 
then uh, this will be uh, the same at every point in space. Although when we talk about phase transitions, we say that the liquid state is disordered, and then you go to lower temperatures, then you get uh, the crystalline state, and that is ordered. But that is not the sense that I'm talking about today. In today's sense, the liquid state also will be ordered in the sense that macroscopically it is homogeneous. That apart from the points near the boundary, if you look at uh, other points in the system, then we'll find out that the local properties are the same everywhere uh, at all these points. Then, I mean, the liquid state also will be ordered in the sense and the crystal state also is going to be ordered in the sense that I'm talking about today, in the sense that the local density is not, not the same everywhere now. The crystal, of course, the particles are uh, preferentially sitting at certain lattice points. Local density will be high near those lattice points and low uh, in between lattice points. But uh, <clears throat> these uh, lattice points themselves, they have this symmetry that uh, if I translate everything by a lattice vector, then I get back the same configuration. So in that sense, both the liquid and the crystal are ordered in the sense that I'm uh, in the sense that I'm going to be using this term today. But then to give you an example of what I'll call disorder in today's context is basically what is known as the amorphous solid. So this is something that we'll come back to later on uh, when a liquid is cooled very fast uh, from a high temperature liquid state. Often it doesn't go into the crystal, but it gets into something which is called a glass where the structure is amorphous. Amorphous meaning that, you know, again, the particles will be localized at certain, at certain positions, but the, those points where the particles are localized, they will not form a regular array like that. They will form some kind of a uh, disordered system. In the sense that, I mean, I cannot say that now, if I uh, translate this whole thing by some amount, then I'll get back the same configuration. They will be in, in a state where this uh, kind of a nice uh, translational symmetry that you have in the crystal, that is not there. So then I'll call this state amorphous and I'll call this state, state uh, disordered. So basically what I uh, try, to, try to convey to you at the very beginning is that uh, when I say disordered system, I will be talking about systems which do not have this nice uh, property that it is uh, invariant under a uh, translation, uh, which is happens in the liquid state, or uh, invariant under translation by any, any amount, which is what happens in a liquid state. Uh, or in the crystalline state, it is translational under, uh, it is invariant under a translation by a lattice vector. When these properties are not present, then what I'll, the kind of systems that we'll be interested in will be called a disordered system. So I hope this definition is clear because uh, it is important to make this distinction because uh, there is often a confusion uh, between uh, what one means by a disordered system. <clears throat> so, uh, what we'll be discussing today is how one looks at such systems and uh, tries to understand their properties theoretically by statistical mechanics uh, of appropriate kind. <clears throat> uh, so then, of course, I mean, you know, when one wants to have a uh, statistical mechanical description, one would uh, like to start with some kind of a Hamiltonian. So the question is, uh, what kind of Hamiltonian would be appropriate for such systems? And uh, uh, what one finds is that in some cases, in particular for this case of the glass transition that I talked about, that you start with a liquid and then cool it rapidly, and then it goes into some kind of an amorphous or disordered state, there the Hamiltonian is transitionally invariant. Hamiltonian is uh, the simple thing, that you have a kinetic energy term, and then you have, let's say, a simple interaction term between uh, two particles, and the interaction potential is assumed to be a function of only the distance between the two particles. And since the distance is invariant under a uniform translation, this uh, Hamiltonian itself is translationally invariant. But the state the system goes into is disordered in the sense that uh, if I now look at the average density, the average density will be picked at points, but these points will not make a regular array. So it is possible that you start with a Hamiltonian which doesn't have any disorder in that sense that it is translationally invariant, but the uh, system basically goes into under certain experimental conditions, goes into a state. Uh, which will be disordered in the sense that I just described to you, uh, in the sense that uh, particles will be localized, but uh, the points where they're localized, they will not uh, make a regular array. So this is one kind of disordered systems. But um, more often than not, or more frequently, what we find is that we get this kind of disordered phases in Hamiltonians that uh, themselves are disordered, in the sense that the Hamiltonian itself is not translationally invariant. So here I have given an example. Yeah, I'm just talking about a system of uh, particles interacting with some potential. So we have the same thing here, uh, kinetic energy, potential energy. So up to this point, 
the Hamiltonian is translational invariant. But then I add to it a term, which is actually often one sees in experiments that, for example, if I want to look at um, a surface and um, one basically uh, has a system of particles which are absorbed on that surface, uh, it's a two-dimensional system and the particles themselves are interacting with each other, but they're also interacting with the surface. And on the surface, if I put some pitting centers, what do you mean by pitting centers? Uh, something, some imperfection or a different kind of particle or something like that. Uh, of course, I mean, nothing is perfect in the sense that if you look at a surface that one prepares experimentally, there are defects, there are um, impurities and things like that, which are sitting on the surface. And uh, <clears throat> these uh, defects themselves or pitting centers, they will interact with the particles that are, that I put on the surface. And uh, this term, the last term that we have in this expression, basically represents the potential that uh, one of these particles see uh, because of its interaction with the pitting centers. So again, basically what I'm talking about is a Hamiltonian, which is translationally invariant here up to this point, where you have kinetic energy and energy of interaction among themselves. But these particles also interact with uh, some other particles which are sitting on, on the surface, uh, <clears throat> which I call pitting, pitting centers. And there will be a potential that this particle will see coming from the spinning centers. And this is what I have written down here. Uh, the potential that a particle, which is located at this point Ri, the ith particle, will see, will be a sum of the pinning potentials that it sees coming from all the other, all the, all the pinning centers. This capital Rj are the positions of the pinning centers. And uh, <clears throat> the randomness comes from the fact that these Rjs do not form a regular structure. They are just sitting at random on this two-dimensional uh, surface. So the potential that a, one of these absorbed particles uh, sees itself uh, will be different at different points because these RGs are fixed for a given sample, but they are uh, located at random. So the potential that a, one of these absorbed particles will see will itself be a, a function of the position, and this function itself will be some kind of a random function because it is a sum of uh, terms, each of which is coming from one pinning center, but the pinning centers are placed at random. As a result, uh, one has a random potential that uh, this absorbed particle sees. So it is interesting, it's important to understand, you know, the basic characteristics of this system. That, and the difference between this kind of a system and that kind of a system. Uh, here, uh, we are talking about uh, a situation where there are no pinning. So the Hamiltonian is invariant under uniform translation. But here I'm talking about a system where there is random pinning. And so the Hamiltonian has uh, usual terms, but another term, which is basically varying from one point in space to another. And this variation is something which is random in the sense that because uh, this uh, potential is coming from a set of pinning centers, which are themselves sitting at random on the, on the, on, on the surface. So these are the kind of problems that now we'll be interested in, that uh, the Hamiltonian itself does not have translational invariance because, I mean, this, this term, of course, is translational invariant, but this term is not because if I go from one point to some other point, then I'll see a different potential generated. And this potential itself is not a regular potential or uh, a function which has some regularity in space. Uh, it basically uh, is a random variable and uh, the potential depends on where the pinning centers are. And if I put the pinning centers at random, then uh, this potential itself will be a random variable. Uh, but uh, one thing that you should remember that if I look at a particular sample, then the pinning centers don't change in the sense that um, the particles that are sitting on this two-dimensional surface, they of course will undergo thermal motion and things like that as usual. Uh, so these are the dynamical variables, this small r's are the dy dynamical variables, but this uh, capital R's, uh, they don't change as a function of time. Experimental traditions typically are such that uh, once you have prepared a sample, there are some pitting centers at some points in the sample, and uh, these points don't move around. They are fixed in time. So there has to be a uh, distinction between uh, these two kinds of variables. One is this uh, small r's, which are dynamical variables. Small p also is a dynamical variable because these things keep on changing as the system evolves in time, but this capital R's don't change as a function of time. So these are variables uh, which are fixed for a given sample. So this is what I might mean by disordered system, in the sense that uh, in most of the disordered systems, the Hamiltonian itself will not be translational and invariant. There will be a term in the Hamiltonian which will uh, vary 
as a function of uh, whatever the, the microscopic variables are position in this particular case. And its variation will be some kind of a, a random variation in the sense that uh, they will be coming from a set of particles which are located at random. <clears throat> so this is a particle model. We also talked about some spin models. We, in particular, we talked about the Ising model, where you have a Hamiltonian, uh, which has this the sigmas of the Ising variables, plus minus one variables. And this sum basically means that only nearest neighbor uh, spins which are sitting at uh, on a lattice, regular lattice, uh, are interacting with each other. And so these, these epsilons are the new things. Earlier, when we were talking about the Ising model, we basically had these Ising spins only. These were the dynamical variables. They can flip. They can go from plus one to minus one or the other way around. And the energy depends on uh, the sigma i and sigma j, two Ising variables sitting at nearest level lattice sites. And uh, if they're parallel, then you have a negative energy. If they're anti-parallel, then you have a positive energy, which is basically what uh, causes, uh, in, the, in the original Ising model, a phase transition from a high temperature uh, paramagnetic phase to a low temperature ferromagnetic phase. But now I am uh, making this problem uh, more difficult, which is actually closer to what one actually sees in experiments. Experiments, uh, no, that is is perfect. One has uh, a crystalline solid, but in the crystalline solid itself, there could be vacancies and interstitials and things like that. And in particular, uh, one is often interested in alloys, where uh, the atoms that are sitting on the lattice can be of two different kinds. And here, we're interested in a situation where one kind gives you these Ising spins, the other kind does not. So this is what I'm talking about here, magnetic ions replaced randomly by non-magnetic ions. Uh, magnetic ions will have a spin with it that will be the, at, the, at the site which is occupied by a magnetic ion. One can define this variable sigma i and sigma j. But of course, uh, the sites where there is a non-magnetic ion, there is no spin. So then the sigma variable doesn't exist. So if I want to look at the Hamiltonian of such a system, I have to introduce these new variables. Epsilon i equals plus one if uh, site i is occupied by a magnetic ion and is equal to zero if site i is occupied by a non-magnetic ion. And then you can see that this term will contribute only when both epsilon i and epsilon j are equal to one. Epsilon i and epsilon j equal to one basically means both the sites are occupied by magnetic ions and then you will have an interaction. But if any one of the sites, any one of the two sites is not occupied by a magnetic ion, then um, it will get zero. I mean, this also ensures that if one of the variables is equal to zero, then uh, this interaction term is not present. So this is now a sort of a modification of the originalizing model. I am introducing disorder because the sites where you have these non-magnetic ions, those sites are going to be randomly distributed in the system. So <clears throat> that uh, uh, we have to specify what fraction of the sites are occupied by this non-magnetic ions, and that fraction is basically uh, some variable which is needed to specify the system. But uh, I know this quantity. When I prepare the alloy, I know what is uh, the concentration of one kind and what is the concentration of the other kind. But I don't have any control uh, about where this uh, non-magnetic ions go. The lattice uh, may still be the same as the square lattice or uh, whatever lattice you have in three dimensions. But some of these lattice sites at random will be occupied by these non-magnetic ions. So these epsilon variables, they are now the random variables. Uh, each, uh, each epsilon, if you look at a particular site i, uh, can be occupied by a magnetic ion or by a non-magnetic ion. And what I, can, what I know externally is just the probability that the site is occupied by a, random, uh, by a magnetic ion or a non-magnetic ion. And this probability is what I have written down here. That uh, C being the concentration, then the probability that a site is occupied by a non-magnetic ion which means that epsilon i equal to zero is going to be equal to c, and one minus c is going to be the probability that it is occupied by a uh, magnetic ion, which corresponds to the value of epsilon uh, equal to one. So this is again an uh, example of uh, basic Hamiltonian, which then doesn't have this transitional invariance because this epsilon i, epsilon j variables, uh, these are uh, of course determined uh, once and for all uh, for the system that we are looking at, and uh, these are uh, random variables. So some sites will be occupied, some sites will not be occupied, and this will happen randomly. As a result, uh, uh, this Hamiltonian down then loses transitional invariance, in the sense that uh, sites which are occupied, of course, are, are, are physically different from the sites that are not occupied. <clears throat> so these are the kind, kind of systems that we'll be looking at. In the case of particle systems, we'll be looking at systems where there is a random external potential coming from pinning centers. Uh, here, if I'm looking at a spin system and dilute 
spin system, dilute magnetic system. There again, uh, some spins will be there, some spins will not be there. Uh, the spins which are there, they will of course have these sigma variables, and these are dynamical variables. They will flip and uh, that will lead to cooperative behavior and things like that. But of course, um, when uh, the spin is not there, then uh, you don't have a six sigma variable. And uh, where the spins are, where the spins are not there, these are basically given randomly. The only thing that you know is the probability of a spin being there or not being there. And uh, <clears throat> once you determine, once you fixed uh, which sites are occupied, occupied by spins and which sites are not occupied by spins, that does not change the function of time anymore. So given that sample, you have the sigma variables, which are the dynamical variables, they will uh, give rise to some cooperative behavior, phase transitions, things like that. But uh, <clears throat> once uh, you have uh, fixed these values, epsilon i, epsilon j, they don't change as a function of time. And this is the property which is uh, very important, that this disorder itself uh, for a particular sample is fixed, given to you, uh, and uh, it doesn't change, it's time independent. That's why this kind of disorder that I'm talking about here uh, is called quenched disorder in the sense that uh, it's time independent. The Hamiltonian is given to you, uh, epsilon i, epsilon j, or in the other case, the positions of the spinning centers, these are given to you, and that gives you a, here a potential. Here it tells us about whether an interaction energy involves the sites or not. Uh, and there are dynamical variables in sigmas in this particular case, the positions of the particles in the other case. And uh, these are the variables that we have to take into account when you do statistical mechanics. But the Hamiltonian itself will depend on this uh, time independent disorder variables, which I call quenched disorder. So I hope this is clear. I wanted to spend a lot of time on this because uh, this will give you uh, basically a, a definition, an idea about what kind of systems we are going to be interested in in this talk today. So the question is now, uh, there are many, many such systems that uh, people study in experiments. First of all, as I said, I mean, nothing is perfect in the sense that when we study crystals theoretically, we assume that uh, every lattice site is occupied by uh, a particular kind of ions and uh, there is a uh, strict uh, periodicity of the system and then one has blocks theorem and things like that which allows us, us to study this uh, uh, theoretically but now we have a situation where uh, that is no longer valid that in addition to the uh, particles uh, that can form a lattice uh, in the previous example there is also other kinds of particles which will give you random potential in this example uh, every lattice site is not occupied by the magnetic species. And uh, again, this happens at random. Some sites are occupied, some sites are not occupied. So we are not dealing with a Hamiltonian, which has a translational invariance. <clears throat> so given such a system, then the question is, uh, what are the uh, questions of interest? So obvious question is that when you have this disorder, then is it at all possible to have the kind of order that we are familiar with? In a crystal, we are familiar with uh, uh, this uh, order associated with the periodic arrangement, the transitional invariance under a lattice vector. Now, if you have a random potential on top of that, then the question is uh, whether you can actually have a crystalline state in the presence of this random potential. In the case uh, of the magnetic system that I just, just talked about, uh, of course, I mean, when there is no this substitutional disorder, when there is uh, only one kind and every side is occupied by a spin, then we know that as you go from high temperature to low temperatures, you go from a paramagnetic to a ferromagnetic state. Now, the question is when you now make the system dilute in the sense that we are removing some of these uh, spins from the lattice sites, whether that system can still have uh, this kind of a phase transition that we are familiar with uh, for the pure system. So I'll make a distinction, this is again terminology, and make a distinction between these disordered systems where you have these disordered variables and the pure system in which uh, uh, the, this disorder that I'm just talking about, uh, that's there in the Hamiltonian, that is not present. Uh, so, I mean, the pure system for particle systems is just kinetic energy plus potential energy. Pure system for the spin system is basically where every bond is there and you have the ordinary Ising model. <clears throat> So whether this kind of disorder can actually uh, destroy the order that you have in the pure system, that is a very important question. Uh, then uh, if uh, ordered state is possible in the uh, in, in the system, that if there is a phase transition from a ferromagnet, uh, paramagnet to a ferromagnet, then the question is whether the phase transition uh, in that system, whether it is going to be very similar to that in the pure system or otherwise, whether this quench disorder will have an effect on the nature of the phase transition. Uh, then, uh, as we'll see uh, as we go along, there is uh, the possibility that uh, this external disorder that I'm introducing in the system can lead to new phases, 
that are not present in systems with uh, quench disorder. And uh, a sort of common feature of all these systems with disorder is that uh, their dynamics is very slow. And again, I'll give you some examples. Uh, so then what is the nature, what is the origin of this slow dynamics? That is another question that many people um, have, have investigated. So there are many other questions, but these are the main questions, that whether this kind of quench disorder uh, destroys the phase transition that you have in the PR system. If it doesn't destroy the phase transition, whether the phase transition has the same characteristics as what you have in the PR system. Uh, and then there could be new phases. And uh, in general, the dynamics is very interesting because uh, all these systems exhibit a very slow dynamics in the sense that uh, if I look at, uh, let's say, how the system is evolving in time, then uh, of course, when uh, system is always evol evolving in time, the question is, what is, what is the time scale associated with that evolution? And that uh, time scale uh, becomes large in uh, disordered systems. <clears throat> So this uh, tells you a simple slide that, uh, yeah, not a simple slide actually, this is uh, actually uh, actual calculations, this becomes very difficult, but it tells you about how you are going to address theoretically the statistical mechanics of such systems. So I have written down uh, three lines and you in general will be familiar with the last line and the line above it. So we are looking at the spin model where the Hamiltonian depends on this dynamical variable sigma i and the disordered variables epsilon i. The sigma i's are uh, the dynamical variables. So if I want to uh, look at the partition function, then one has to sum over this sigma i variables for a fixed realization of this epsilon i. Epsilon i are the random variables that tells us about whether a site is occupied or not. And once that is in a given sample, that doesn't change as a function of time. So these are the uh, quenched variables and these are the uh, dynamical variables of the system. So if I look at a particular sample, the values of epsilon i, of course, are given to you. Some sites are occupied, some sites are not occupied, but there is no way of your knowing which site is occupied and which site is not occupied. All you know is that a site is occupied with some probability and unoccupied with some probability. Uh, so uh, then given the Hamiltonian, then one can get a partition function. From that, one can get uh, Helmholtz free energy by taking the logarithm of the partition function. And this function is supposed to contain all thermodynamic inf information. From this uh, Helmholtz uh, free energy, one can calculate uh, whatever one wants to calculate. One can calculate the internal energy, one can calculate the entropy, one can calculate heat capacity, all those things can be calculated. But the problem is that you don't know what are the values of epsilon i. So all you know is that uh, some site can be occupied with probability, uh, some probability, 1 minus c in the example that I gave you, and unoccupied uh, with probability c. So if, there's no way that you're going to calculate this quantity theoretically. Because uh, here, the Hamiltonian, you don't know. You know that uh, if a site is occupied, uh, then uh, we'll, we'll have epsilon i equals one. And if it is unoccupied, it will have epsilon i equal to zero. But for a given sample, you don't know where what this variable epsilon i is. So although this uh, formula is very easy to write down, there is no way that for a given large macroscopic system, uh, we'll be able to calculate what this f is. And since you don't have the information about this epsilon i's, some kind of an average has to be done for this uh, epsilon i. And due to theoretical reasons that I will not have time to go into, what uh, one needs to calculate, the quantity that, that is relevant for the thermodynamics of such systems, is the average value of this, uh, of this uh, Helmholtz free energy. By average, I mean that now if epsilon of, if of course depends on all the epsilon i's. Uh, so basically, when you average, the average over, the probability distribution associated with these random variables. So this is what I'm doing. The, there is a probability of epsilon i being zero or one, and those probabilities are assumed to be independent of which i you are looking at. Net probability is a product of these probabilities, and then you have to integrate over all this uh, epsilon i's to get some kind of an average. And uh, this average is something that uh, contains all the physical information about the system. So. <clears throat> Uh, and there are theoretical methods for doing this average. This is called, there's something called a replica trick, which one uses to calculate these averages, which uh, of course goes into uh, some uh, more uh, detailed description, which I will not have time to go into. But uh, just uh, want to tell you that uh, uh, this is the quantity that theoretically one needs to calculate. And uh, there are methods for doing that when one has to average over the probability distribution associated with this uh, random variables then from that one can calculate various quantities of interest. <clears throat> so as I just told you, just one, one uh, transparency ago, 
uh, one of the interesting these are some of the interesting questions so one can ask is the crystalline state possible in systems with random p when you have this random potential of course when you have a random potential there are random forces so the particles will be displaced from their equilibrium positions uh, in the absence of these random forces and if the displacements are large then we we'll no longer have a periodic arrangement so that is the question that whether uh, if you have such kind of a random pinning when, whether these displacements are big enough so that uh, it destroys the crystalline structure and a theoretical way that uh, crystalline state is possible no crystalline state is possible in two or three dimensions in systems with random pinning so here the disorder is very important the quench disorder actually completely gets rid of the ordered state that you have in the pure system disorder that has to be taken into account in understanding what is going on in low temperatures in such systems <clears throat> there's a picture here that i'll show uh, one can actually depending on which system you're looking at and here we're looking at a uh, system of uh, vortices in a superconductor they form a regular lattice when there is no disorder but uh, in, in some and uh, because of the disorder uh, this crystalline arrangement that you would get in a very pure system that will get completely destroyed and uh, one can actually image these vortices and here you can see that this uh, this dark points are where the vortices are located and uh, they have some similarity with the crystal but if you look at it carefully we'll see that it doesn't have this proper crystalline arrangement that you would associate with uh, the pure system experimentally also one finds that uh, the spinning disorder basically destroys the crystalline arrangement that you have in the PR system. Uh, the second problem uh, uh, I mentioned, where you have this uh, dilute system, where some uh, lattice sites are occupied by uh, magnetic uh, <coughs> spins and some lattice sites are, uh, are empty, they don't have this magnetic spin. So, in the presence of such disorder, uh, then again the question is whether this kind of ferromagnetic state that you have at low temperatures in the PR system, uh, whether uh, that kind of ferromagnetic state is possible when you have. And there again, theoretical considerations tell you that uh, yes, it is possible, but if the concentration of this non magnetic species is large, then this uh, state is not possible. This is the concentration of these non magnetic ions. If the C is sufficiently small, then you can still have a ferromagnetic state at low temperatures. High temperatures, of course, I mean, uh, it's always going to be paramagnetic. In the pure system, you're going to have a paramagnetic state where there is no magnetization. But uh, if the fraction of uh, uh, fraction of sites where there is no magnetic species is sufficiently small, then the remaining uh, sites uh, where you have this magnetic uh, spins, the sigma variables are present, there you can actually have uh, a phase transition where one goes from high temperature, one goes from a paramagnetic phase, high temperature paramagnetic phase to a ferromagnetic phase. Interesting that I just wanted to point out. Uh, this is called percolation, and this is another thing that is uh, one of the sort of nice problems in the theory of disordered systems. So this picture basically illustrates uh, uh, what I mean. So <clears throat> this is this is a computer generated picture. What one has is a square lattice in two dimensions, and only a certain fraction of the sites are occupied by spins, let's say. And whenever you have spins, you put down this dot. These these are the sites that are occupied by magnetic spins and the sites that are not occupied by magnetic spins i am not uh, showing them they are basically this uh, blank area that you have in this picture and here uh, i have put uh, only a small number of magnetic spins and they are distributed at random this is what i mean by that random it's at random some that is sites are occupied by magnetic spins some other others are not occupied and here you see that the occupied sites basically make very small clusters Clusters basically means that here you have, you have three sites which are next to each other. So I'll call this a cluster. So I mean, the two sites which are next to each other, I'll call that a cluster and so on. So the point is when the number of magnetic spins is small, the magnetic spins themselves form only small clusters. As you go to larger concentration of magnetic spins, then this cluster size grows. Here you see that when you have a higher concentration, then you will have bigger clusters. Here you have a big cluster. And this continues until there is a concentration which is in this particular system between 50 and 60 percent, where the cluster basically spans the whole system. And here you have a cluster here, the occupied sites, which are given by this crosses, which goes from this end of the system to that end of the system. This is called a spanning cluster. 
and this is possible only when the fraction of magnetic sites is sufficiently large. So uh, if I now look at the magnetic systems, then uh, the behavior is very different depending on whether you are on this side or on that side. On this side, if the concentration of the magnetic species is small, then you don't have any infinite cluster. And I told you in one of my lectures that to see the transition from the paramagnet to ferromagnet, you need basically an infinitely large system. This symmetry breaking is possible theoretically only in the thermodynamic limit. In practice, of course, you see this, but you see this only when the number of number is very large. Not infinity, but uh, of the order of Avogadro's number. So here, since all the clusters are finite, you will not have any magnetic uh, phase transition. Because in a finite system, you cannot have this uh, phase transition, the breaking of symmetry that is uh, inherent in the phase transition. But here, uh, if I go to 60 now, I mean, if I'm now looking at this picture, there is a connected cluster, which is infinite. Uh, infinite in the, in the infinite system size limit. Here, I'm talking about a cluster, which is the same, uh, which spans the system. So the length of the cluster is basically the same as the uh, length of the whole system. And if you make the system go to infinity, then this cluster also will become infinite. And the spins sitting on those clusters, they will be able to uh, have a ferromagnetic fields. So you can see here now that depending on the concentration of the, uh, of the sites which contain uh, one can go from a situation where if the concentration is low, then you don't have a phase transition because you don't have an infinite cluster. But if the concentration is high enough, uh, there's a threshold between 50 and 60 uh, <clears throat> such that if the concentration is bigger than that, then you will always have uh, this kind of an infinite cluster. And in this case, you can have a phase transition. So that, that is what uh, you mentioned here, uh, magnetically ordered state possible in systems if uh, the concentration of the C is the concentration of uh, magnetic species. So if C with C is sufficiently small, then you have an infinite cluster of the magnetic uh, species, and that cluster can undergo a phase transition uh, as, as uh, before uh, in the case of pure system. <clears throat> One can ask whether the nature of this phase transition is the same as that, uh, what you have in the pure system, and that depends on various other uh, things like dimension and things like that, which are not going to. But it says that uh, this random uh, kind of uh, dilution in this particular case can actually destroy the phase transition if uh, the concentration of this non-magnetic species is sufficiently large. <coughs> you must have sufficiently large number of this magnetic species, and only then you can have a ferromagnetic state. In the case, the other case, any random potential will actually destroy the uh, crystalline order. So that the effect of disorder is very strong. So these are the sort of things that uh, one is interested in. Uh, if you have this kind of quench disorder, then what effect it has on the physical properties. And in particular here, we're interested in the cooperative properties uh, and one can see that uh, it can have a very strong effect. The second uh, question that I have, that I had in the list of questions here. So we have just talked about this. You also mentioned a little bit about that, that uh, uh, in the dilute system, there could be a phase transition, but it, nature of the phase transition may be different from what you have in the PR system. Now I want to give you an example of uh, novel phases that arise because you have disorder. Uh, and uh, that is a very important problem in the study of disordered systems, which is called a spin glass. So here I'm starting with that. Uh, uh, basically trying to tell you about what uh, we are interested in, in the spin glass problem. Uh, again, it's a problem with quench disorder. So physically, what one is looking at is here a alloy as before. Uh, and the alloy is uh, the two elements. One, let's say, is copper, the other is manganese. The copper is a metal, uh, doesn't have any magnetism. But mang manganese is uh, something that has this spins. So this alloy uh, will have uh, spins sitting at um, at copper sites. Uh, same thing is uh, this is iron and gold. Here uh, gold of course is a metal and iron is a ferromagnetic species. So there will be spins at the iron sites but there will not be any spins at the gold sites. And if you have the spins and as I said this uh, distribution of this spins will be at random. Yeah, this is a lattice and the sites where you have these arrows those represent sites which are occupied by the magnetic species manganese or iron. And uh, these sites are uh, placed at random in the lattice. Now the question is, if I have these two spins here, 
what is the interaction between these two spins and this interaction uh, has a uh, interaction parameter the coupling constant that depends on the distance between these two and it depends on the distance in a periodic manner and this is happens because the host metal is uh, host particle are actually metallic so there are conduction electrons and the conduction electrons basically mediate the interaction between these two localized spins formula one can one can calculate it's an elementary thing to calculate uh, taking into account the fact that the electrons are fermions they have a fermi energy a fermi surface and there one finds that the interaction is has this periodicity so this is what i have plotted here as a function of the distance between the two and you can see that this is zero so depending on some distances it can be negative some distances it can be positive so depending on how far these two spins are they will interact ferromagnetically or antiferromagnetically depending on the separation between these two and these j's are fixed for a given sample for a given sample the positions of the spins are fixed they are not changing as a function of time that is why the uh, disorder is quenched and once you have these particles fixed at these positions uh, then one inquires about the interaction interaction will depend on the distance and uh, it will vary as a function of distance in a periodic manner for some pairs let's say for these pairs interaction can be ferromagnetic which uh, wants to make these two spins parallel to each other whereas in some other pair depending on the distance uh, the interaction can be antiferromagnetic uh, where uh, the interaction prefers the two spins to be pointing in opposite directions and once the system is uh, sample is prepared uh, these interactions themselves are fixed but uh, these interactions uh, since the positions of these particles are at random interaction also will be a random variable this interaction is Ruderman, Kittel, Kasuya, yes. You can worry about it. But uh, the form of this interaction is important that it oscillates in sign depending on the distance between the two spins that we're interested in. <clears throat> so you can see that now we have uh, some ferromagnetic, some antiferromagnetic interaction, and they're distributed in random in space. So the question is, uh, system can have, does it, can it have any, any kind of an order? Experiment. But as you reduce the temperature, whether a new kind of order, any kind of order, is possible in this instance. And it turns out that, yes, it is possible. So people have uh, done experiments on such uh, alloys. And uh, here is an experimental result, for example, where one is plotting the magnetic susceptibility. Oh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with what we call a susceptibility. If we put in a magnetic field, then there's a magnetization. And uh, the magnetization divided by the magnetic field is the susceptibility at when the field is small susceptibility is then basically the derivative of the magnetization uh, with respect to the applied magnetic field in the limit where the magnetic field is going to zero <clears throat> so this is experimental result uh, some although i mean uh, this is taken from a review article but uh, this is experimental result as you can see here as a function of temperature and uh, you are uh, basically plotting the susceptibility and then you see that uh, there is an increase in the susceptibility as one is going to lower temperatures. Some of you may be familiar with this kind of an increase. It's called the Curie law. Uh, it's uh, susceptibility is proportional to one over the temperature. Uh, but then it, at uh, low temperature, which is here, around 10 degrees or something like that, uh, the behavior changes. And you see some kind of a sharp cusp in the susceptibility, which indicates that there is some kind of a phase transition. So this is one example of uh, a disordered system where experiment has, this is what actually experiments are done and then people try to understand what is going on here experiment uh, this is usually what happens in condensed matter physics that people do experiments and find interesting results and then the task of the people who do theory is to try to understand what is going on there so <clears throat> this is uh, uh, one such phenomenon also what one finds is that as one goes to temperatures lower than this temperature uh, then the dynamics becomes very slow this is another thing that i pointed out that in disordered systems the uh, dynamics can be quite slow so again there is this experiment that i uh, discussed in uh, not in great detail but i mean just tell you what is going on so here again i'm plotting the susceptibility as a function of uh, temperature but uh, let's say for a given sample uh, two percent of uh, two percent of uh, manganese in copper this experiment uh, this uh, uh, binary system is what i'm discussing here uh, this is the temperature at which you see this cusp. And this cusp is, is seen when uh, you calculate the susceptibility after cooling the system and then apply a magnetic field. If you cool the system in uh, a magnetic field, it, I mean, to get susceptibility, you have to apply a magnetic field and then you measure the magnetization. 
and uh, you can do the experiment in different ways. Uh, in some cases, uh, as in this lower curve, that I'm, you first put the system in zero magnetic field, and then you apply the magnetic field. And then you measure some magnetization, and that uh, gives you susceptibility, which shows this cost. But you can also do the experiment differently, that you apply the magnetic field at high temperatures, and then cool the system. So there is this two, two different things. One is called the zero field susceptibility, and the other is called uh, the so zero field cooled and zero field cooled susceptibility or magnetization that one sees. And one finds different behavior, depending on whether a magnetic field was applied above this TC or whether it was applied below TC. If it's applied below TC and then you measure the magnetization and from the susceptibility, then you get this lower curve. If you apply the magnetic field above TC and then cool, then you get this, this curve. So it tells you that depending on the history of the, how we prepare the system, one can go into different states which is something that uh, is uh, reminiscent of uh, that, that i mean theoretically you can explain by saying that the system has become very slow so when you make a perturbation system takes a very very long time to respond to this perturbation so what you're happening here is that as you reduce the temperature let's say you're looking at the uh, lower curve which is zero field code so you put in a zero field go to a temperature which is lower then you apply the magnetic field and you measure the measure the magnetization or the susceptibility so you get a lower value but then one can do the experiment also as a function of time, that one applies the field and then waits for one hour. After that, one measures. So then one finds that this lower line begins to move up. And eventually, very long times, and in many cases, it's not possible to wait till such very long times, the curve goes from the lower curve, uh, lower line, to the upper line. So what one is, uh, I mean, the interpretation of this experiment is that uh, the upper line represents the true equilibrium state in a magnetic field, whereas the lower one is some kind of a metastable state. And then if you wait long enough, then this lower one eventually will go there uh, because, of course, I mean, in a metastable state has a finite lifetime, but this lifetime can be extremely large. So this is basically what I call uh, slow dynamics at low temperatures. And this is called glassy behavior. For ordinary glasses also, one finds this uh, very slow dynamics. So that is why this system is called the spin glass. That is uh, the dynamical variables are spins, but it is showing behavior, extremely slow relaxation that is similar to what one finds in glasses. So this is a quench random system uh, <clears throat> having these two, two components and uh, you know, positions of the magnetic species are uh, distributed randomly uh, in the lattice and they have this both positive and negative interactions. And uh, the experiments suggest that these systems do exhibit some kind of a phase transition, but it is very different from either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic transition that you get in pure systems. <clears throat> and uh, the reason that the phase transition is very different is something that uh, one can sort of uh, uh, begin to understand by looking at uh, this, uh, this picture, where I have introduced a quantity which is called frustration. Uh, so in the system that I was talking about, one has this magnetic spins, and some of the interactions are positive, some of the interactions are negative. So, and if you just look at it, then you will see that uh, given that situation, uh, it is not possible to minimize the energy of all pair interactions. <clears throat> so when I say that the pair interaction can be minimized, then uh, the, the terminology is that that pair is satisfied. But you cannot satisfy all pair interactions simultaneously, and that leads to uh, every every pair since it cannot be satisfied. This is led to this term, which is called a frustration. So this is illustrated very easily in this picture. Let's say you have three such spins, and uh, the interactions are uh, antiferromagnetic for all of these pairs. Antiferromagnetic means that the spin at this side and spin at that side they want to be antiparallel to each other. So if I want to draw, let's say, uh, the spin configuration that we'll get, which will minimize the energy associated with this uh, triangle, then if I look at one and two, since they're antiferromagnetic, the spin one will be, a uh, spin two would like to be antiparallel to spin one. So this is what I have shown here. Let's say the spin one is pointing in the up direction. Then since this is an antiferromagnetic interaction, the spin two would like to point in a down direction. Uh, I can do the same thing for this bond. If, uh, this is also so if it is pointing up then the other one the top one has to point down but then uh, these two spins are parallel to each other so then uh, this interaction is still antiferromagnetic then we cannot minimize 
the energy associated with this bond because uh, to, if i want to minimize the bond here and bond there then that will give you uh, two spins which are parallel to each other which of course is uh, this anti-ferromagnetic interaction doesn't want you to have so this is a very simple example that says that depending on the uh, interactions that you have here then uh, uh, there will be and if this happens at random that there, i mean in the system that i'm talking about that could be plus j and minus j and uh, if i look at a, a three such spins there is always a possibility that the distances are such that these three uh, all of them have anti ferromagnetic interactions and in that case i will not be able to satisfy all these three interactions simultaneously and this is what leads to what is known as uh, frustration and you can see that uh, for this three spin system there are different uh, arrangements of the spins which will give you the same energy and that comes from choosing uh, which bond is going to be frustrated so to speak in this example that i give you the first one this bond is satisfied because the spins are anti-parallel this bond is satisfied again the spins are anti-parallel but this bond is not satisfied because uh, the spins are parallel here but the bond is anti-ferromagnetic but i can choose this differently i can choose this to be this uh, bond or that bond or that bond and then if i so this gives you these three configurations which are the same energy or you can flip all the spins i mean going from here to there i can make this down and make this up and again then this bond is frustrated and you will get six such uh, states all of them have the same energy and this is the lowest possible energy that this cluster can have so this illustrates the fact that if you have this kind of a disorder that i just told you about you have this spin glass kind of a model where uh, the spins are uh, located random and the interactions between pairs of spins can be both positive and negative depending on the distance then there will be triplets like this where uh, you cannot satisfy all the interactions and to minimize the energy of that triplet uh, it's not just one configuration that minimizes the energy uh, there are several configurations six configurations in this particular case which will minimize the energy so this basically is what i'm telling you here that frustration leads to a multiplicity of ground states in the spin system mm. Uh, this was not there in the pure models that we talked about earlier because there are all the interactions were, uh, let's say, ferromagnetic. That's the one that, that we looked at. So every bond can be satisfied by making all the spins parallel to each other. But uh, <clears throat> when we have this situation that uh, there could be both uh, plus J and minus J, and uh, uh, <clears throat> the value whether it's going to be positive or negative it depends on how uh, how distant the two spins are the spins are at random so one can have uh, this kind of a triplet where uh, all three are minus j and then you see that uh, to minimize the energy of such uh, a, a, a triplet of spins uh, <clears throat> it's not just one configuration but many configurations which will minimize the energy <clears throat> uh i have to find out uh, how many how many minutes do we have this i cannot see it on my uh, monitor because it's full screen so you can take your time <laughs> okay <clears throat> so this is this is uh, something that was not there in the uh, models that we discussed earlier the last two days that there the ordered state was quite simple but here you see that because uh, of this disorder that you have, the spins are located at random, and some pairs of uh, positive interaction, some pairs of negative interaction, uh, there could be situations where uh, finding the ground state itself is, is a problem. So here, if there are only three spins, but of course, I mean, you know, in the real system, there are a huge number of spins, and they have this plus j's and minus j's distributed randomly. So finding the ground state uh, is going to be a very difficult problem. Actually, it's a nice problem in computer science, and there are some computer science algorithms that people have used to calculate the ground states or find the ground states of such a system. And what they find is that there are many, many such states with the same energy, same low energy. So this leads to a multiplicity of uh, the ground states. And this is a very important feature that uh, we'll see in other uh, disorder systems also. And it is this uh, multiplicity of ground states that leads to this slow dynamics because you see that as we pull the system system would like to go to a one of this one of this uh, low energy states but there are many many such low energy states so if the system wants to equilibrate then it has to visit all these low energy states and if there are a very large number of them then going from one such low energy state to another one uh, is going to be a slow process and so that this is what basically leads to this slow dynamics that you see for example in this picture where uh, whether you are uh, pulling the system in a field or whether pulling the system and then applying a field, 
then you get different results. And going from one to the other is a very, very slow process. And this is the slow dynamics or glassy dynamics that I'm talking about. And uh, this arises in these systems because of this frustration, which uh, comes from a mixture, a random mixture of plus J and minus J in such a way that uh, in many cases, you will find that there are some pair interactions that you cannot uh, satisfy. Satisfy basically means that uh, energy associated with that pair interaction cannot be easily minimized. And if you have a large number of such spins, then we find many, many ground states. Dynamics at low temperatures is uh, governed by basically these low energy states. But if there is a very large number of them, then the system has to basically uh, take a long time to visit. Let's say if it's get confined near one of these low energy states, then it has to find the time to go over some energy barriers to the basin of some other uh, low energy state. And this process is very slow. That is what gives you slow dynamics. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> This is uh, now uh, a different paradigm, so to speak. I mean, the kind of things that we are talking about earlier for pure systems uh, do not apply here because you are ending up with a situation where there is a huge multiplicity of low energy states, and you have to take into account their presence uh, in uh, description. <clears throat> so people have developed theories, and uh, I will uh, not. Uh, uh, have time to actually tell you about the theoretical formulation, but I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what kind of phase transition is possible in these systems. <clears throat> so, uh, as, you, as I, I, I told you that there is uh, indication of this special temperature, such that the dynamics become slow below this temperature. There is also uh, this cusp in the susceptibility, which says that something is going on. And actually, there is a phase transition in this system, but it is very different from the phase transition that you have in the ferromagnetic IC model. So here, this uh, slide sort of tells you in words what this new phase is. So high temperature phase, uh, sigma i is, of course, is the spin that we are talking about. Uh, we can take, on, take the values plus or minus 1. And its uh, thermodynamic average is 0. This is the same parametric state that we had earlier, that there is no order. So there's magnetization, which is the sum of the average value of this sigma i averages, that is equal to 0. As you go to lower temperatures in the spin glass system, then one encounters a new kind of ordered state, where uh, the spins are frozen, in the sense that for a particular site i, the sigma i average will be non-zero. But different sites will be, uh, the spins at different sites will be frozen in different directions. As a result, the sigma i average will have positive sign for some sites and will have some negative side, a negative sign for some other sites. And as a result, when you average over all the sites that you have in your large system, this m will still be equal to zero. So just by looking at m, will not be able to distinguish between the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase. But there is a difference because here, each individual spin averages to zero. They are flipping with both plus or minus. But here, each spin is preferentially in the plus one or uh, preferentially in the minus one. So these averages will be non-zero. But different spins will be frozen in different directions. So the when you average over all the sides, this will give you zero. So then one can define a different kind of order parameter that I told you, which distinguishes between the ordered state and the disordered state, which is very simple, actually. You take, instead of just averaging this quantity, you average the square of that quantity. So whenever this is non-zero, uh, this uh, average of the square will give you something which is non-zero. If you just take the average, this will give you zero because some can be positive and some can be negative. But if I take the square and then average, then uh, this quantity will be non-zero as long as the spins are frozen. So this is a new kind of phase. The high temperature phase, the spins flip uh, as the system goes through different configurations. And you have basically uh, each individual spin will average to zero. Whereas uh, in this uh, low temperature, that uh, dynamics has become very slow. System gets stuck into some of these uh, states that I just mentioned earlier. As a result, uh, <coughs> the thermal average of individual spins is non-zero. Uh, and to see that, you have to take the square and then average over all the sides because uh, this sigma i average can be plus one or minus one with equal probability. Uh, so and then when you do the magnetization, that will be zero. So the, this magnetization is the order parameter that distinguish between the uh, paramagnetic and the ferromagnetic phase in the simple examples that we talked about earlier in the pure system. But now this order parameter is not adequate. You have to look at the average of individual spins and then square it and then take the average over all the spins and then we'll get a non-zero value. So again, you know, one has a phase transition where there is an appropriate order parameter, which is zero above the transition and non-zero below the transition. And then one can study various features of this phase transition and so on, which has been done. I want to point out that this phase transition is very, very different 
from uh, the phase transition that you have either in the ferromagneticizing model or the anti ferromagneticizing model. And this difference is essentially coming from the fact that the interaction parameters can be both positive or negative, uh, both positive and negative, with equal probability, depending on which pair of spins you are looking at. So this, uh, I hope, you know, gives you some flavor of the kind of new physics that you have that you encountered when you deal with this kind of uh, uh, disordered systems. Uh, I will spend just five minutes on uh, a similar system. See, we call spin glass because it has some properties which are similar to ordinary glass. And what are the properties of this ordinary glass that these systems have? Uh, this is basically what I just wanted to explain in five minutes. So this uh, ordinary glass, let's not go into all of this. The ordinary glass you get when you start from a liquid and you cool it rapidly to a temperature which is below the transition temperature at which it becomes a crystal. So Tm is the crystallization temperature and uh, the liquid uh, is being cooled. So if you cool it slowly, then at this temperature, it will become a crystal. But we avoid this crystallization by cooling it rapidly. So then you go to a temperature which is lower than this Tm but the system is still in liquid. This is this super cooling that I talked about when we were discussing phase transitions. Uh, so you can keep the system in the liquid state even at temperatures lower than this TM by cooling it fast. And then the system goes into some kind of a, a state which is uh, uh, solid, but uh, this doesn't have the crystalline order that you associate with the crystalline solid. So this is the glass transition phenomenon that uh, you cool a liquid fast and then it, you can super cool it. And then if you cool it further, then it will go into some kind of an amorphous state, which is a solid for its mechanical properties. But if you look at the arrangement of the ions, then it will be, uh, it will not be periodic. What you have, let's say if you are looking at water, then you get the glass ice here. But then if you pull it, if you can avoid this ice crystallization, then eventually you will get amorphous water at uh, low temperatures. So this is the difference that the crystalline structure has a periodic arrangement of the, uh, the particles but you have a glass or amorphous structure where the particles are localized, but they're localized at sort of uh, uh, random, random positions, not quite random, but very different from the periodic arrangement that you have in a crystal. And the important thing is that uh, <coughs> the dynamics becomes very slow. That is the other thing that has mentioned that uh, this is the characteristic of glassy systems that uh, if you look at uh, measure of the dynamics for liquids, it's uh, viscosity. The viscosity increases by 14 orders of magnitude as you change the temperature by a relatively small amount, maybe 50 degrees. And so these are many different uh, uh, materials which undergo this glass transition. And one is, uh, we are particularly interested in this kind of uh, behavior where uh, uh, the viscosity, it's a log scale. So it's going from minus two to 12, 14 orders of magnitude over a time scale, which uh, depends of course on the, on the material that you are looking at, but it's of the order of 50 degrees uh, Kelvin. So this is a, a signature of very slow dynamics. And this slow dynamics uh, near the glass transition is what uh, will, most people have been interested in. And as I said, in the spin glass case also, we found that uh, equilibration is very slow. Uh, so in that sense, both of them are similar in the sense that you have this glassy behavior. <clears throat> so there are several things that are there, but uh, this is a slide that I want to spend some time on because now, this is what uh, explains this kind of very slow dynamics or glassy behavior that I just discussed. In the case of ordinary glass or in the case of spin glass, there are many other models where you see this kind of slow dynamics. And there, the fact that I mentioned some time ago that uh, there are many, many uh, sort of ground states, so to speak, quote unquote, uh, states which uh, very low energies. But uh, in ordinary systems, in ordinary ferromagnet, you will just get two ground states where all the spins are pointing up one ground state and all the spins pointing down in another ground state. But in spin glasses, you will see that uh, there are a very large number of states for which the energy is uh, nearly minimum. And uh, ordinary glasses also, the same thing happens, people have studied. And uh, this leads to this simple picture that if I plot the potential energy as a function of, uh, let's say, some coordinates of, uh, of the system, then instead of having just one or two minima, there will be many, many local minima. And that is called the energy landscape. So you have a local minimum here, local minimum there. Some of them are deep, some of them are not so deep. And then uh, in the original glass problem, there would be a global minimum, which corresponds to the crystal, which has, is the deepest. But in addition to that, there will be many amorphous minima, which will have some distribution of their energies. 
and uh, when the system wants to equilibrate it can get stuck in one of these minima and uh, then you know this is let's say glassy minimum amorphous minimum this is another amorphous minimum uh, and the potential energy has uh, this kind of a barrier uh, to go from here to there and so at low temperatures it will be very improbable for the system if it gets stuck in this basin to go from this basin to that basin overcoming this energy barrier uh, so this is what makes the dynamics very slow this is also why you can avoid the glass run uh, avoid the crystallization transition because this is just one minimum but if you cool the system fast then uh, it will get stuck in one of the other minima and to from there to go to the glass uh, to the global minima which is the crystalline minima will take a very very long time so the system doesn't crystallize but it uh, gets stuck into one of the amorphous minima and relapses very very slowly because there are many many such amorphous minima and to go from one to the other you have to overcome this potential energy barriers and uh, the uh, process of overcoming this potential energy barrier becomes uh, very slow if you are at low temperatures and if the barrier uh, height is is large so <clears throat> this is basically the sort of a physical picture of why this uh, you know, systems have this slow dynamics why the time scale has become so large as you go to lower and lower temperatures uh, both in the uh, ordinary glass problem and in the uh, spin glass problem and uh, again you know, one can take this into account in a theoretical description uh, but that's something that uh, we'll not go into because that uh, in becomes uh, quite important uh, definition of many different quantities and things like that but the physical picture that we have for this uh, disordered systems like spin glass and uh, ordinary glass is that uh, because the interactions are random the interactions in the spin glass the interaction between pairs of spins can be either positive or negative uh, in this case, of course, the interactions are not random in the sense that uh, the same Hamiltonian that we talked about earlier, the same Hamiltonian that uh, uh, describes the liquid state of the system at high temperatures. So there is no quench disorder here, but here the disorder is self-generated. That is another thing that is very interesting about this uh, glass, ordinary glass, that it generates the disorder itself uh, through sort of getting stuck into one of this uh, amorphous uh, minima, local minima of the potential energy and once it gets stuck then it's a metastable state but it's a very long lifetime so glass uh, actually if you just prepare a glass window glass or something like that and just leave it for years it never crystallizes so the, the point is uh, crystal state state is the is the is the lowest energy or free energy state but the glassy state is uh, metastable and uh, metastable with a very very large lifetime and as a result, uh, once it gets stuck into one of these uh, metastable minima, it doesn't, uh, uh, in any finite amount of time, it doesn't go to uh, <clears throat> the global minimum, which in most cases would be a crystal. So these are features of done, uh, uh, features of condensed matter physics uh, disordered systems. Uh, if I have some 5-10 minutes, then I also want to sort of point out that this kind of problems are very important these days in uh, several other problems that are not uh, directly related to condensed matter physics. So <clears throat> I just wanted to give you one or two examples of such glassy systems that people are interested in other disciplines. And uh, this picture that I just wanted to tell you about, that this picture of this complexity in the energy landscape that uh, has been very uh, successfully used property of such glassy systems. <clears throat> so one... Uh, example uh, of what is known as uh, combinatorial optimization and uh, the standard problem there is the traveling cell span problem so uh, just to sort of define it in two minutes uh, what one is trying to do is the following that there are n cities n can be large number and uh, salesman has to go to all of these cities and uh, salesman doesn't want to go to any city more than once <clears throat> So uh, basically what one has to do is one has, wants to construct a tour uh, in which you know, this uh, tour basically corresponds to a, a string of such numbers. Uh, the numbers one to or, uh, up to n will appear in this string once and only once, but uh, they will appear in different permutations depending on in which order the salesman actually is visiting the city. So if I look at just one, two up to n, it says that the salesman has gone to, to city one first and then gone to city two and etc etc if i permute this uh, and there are basically n factorial ways in which i can permute this uh, n levels then it will be a different sequence of the same numbers and that corresponds to a different uh, two 
and uh, the objective is to find the code which will minimize the tool length. So this is what uh, I've written down here. So distance, this this is this is a distance which uh, tells us about if you give give two values of uh, two numbers here, that will tell you about the distance between the cities which are numbered by uh, this P1 and P2. P1, all this P is basically represent a permutation. And then you add uh, the uh, two to three distance, then you add uh, n minus one to n distance, and uh, eventually it comes back to the home base. So it's Pn to P1, and it give, this gives you uh, the total tool length. And uh, different tools are obtained by permuting these levels, one up to n, and there are n factorial, and so it's n is large, even if it is as large as, let's say, 100, then n factorial is a huge number. So there are many, many different tools are possible, and uh, the, um, uh, the objective is to find the tool that globally minimizes this tool length. And uh, this is a problem uh, in operations such as computer science that many people have uh, worked on. And uh, simple algorithms to find the uh, optimal uh, tool, the, <clears throat> they don't work. That uh, you find that you know uh, here, for example, uh, there are these uh, cities that I have uh, that uh, the salesman has to visit in, in Iowa, uh, state of the US. And uh, here, uh, this is an example of a typical tool uh, that I have given you. But there are, as I said, n factorial different tools, and you cannot really enumerate all these n factorial tools and find out which one gives you the, uh, the, the smallest length. So there has to be some nice algorithms to find, uh, if not a truly up to optimal one, but uh, tools which are near optimal in the sense that uh, uh, length of the tool is uh, not the global minimum, but it's a local minimum and uh, uh, it's a low enough uh, local minimum. So there are many, many algorithms that people have developed. But uh, here, uh, the difficulty with this finding a good algorithm for this is essentially what you were talking about earlier. That if I uh, look at this quantity as, let's say, the energy function, the Hamiltonian, and uh, this permutation as the variable that you are using. So in this picture that I had there, there was a variable here, and there was uh, energy there. So in the traveling salesman problem, uh, <coughs> the variable that is on the x-axis is the permutation which which order you are visiting this uh, uh, cities on the y-axis you are looking at the two length associated with that particular two that particular permutation then you will find that there are many many local minimum just as you know as trying to sort of schematically show in that previous uh, picture and simple algorithms basically get stuck into local minimum and uh, they cannot go all the way down to a near optimal minimum because of this fact and so then one has to have uh, a clever algorithm uh, to actually find uh, the global minimum or if that is generally not possible this is called basically in computer science this is called uh, uh, np problem uh, <coughs> which cannot be solved in polynomial time uh, but uh, physics tells you about some uh, heuristic algorithms that gives you very good results and uh, one of these algorithms is uh, what is known as simulated annealing uh, which people have developed in the study of uh, these glasses or spin glasses, uh, where one uh, wants to have algorithms which will go to a, a low uh, minimum of the potential energy. And those kind of algorithms have found a lot of success in uh, trying to find uh, global or will not get global, global minimum generally if the number of, uh, number of uh, cities is large, but uh, to a low lying local minimum of that uh, uh, objective function that can be obtained by uh, using this uh, kind of algorithms that people have developed in the study of classes and spin classes. <clears throat> Just one more example, if you bear with me, I think I have exceeded my time, but uh, <clears throat> another problem uh, that is in a, again, a very different area, uh, biology is a very standard problem, which is protein folding. What is a protein basically corresponds to is a long polymer. Let me not go into details. Uh, <clears throat> a long polymer consisting of this amino acids. High temperature, this polymer is stretched out. And then as you go to low temperatures, uh, body temperature, the physiological temperature, this uh, uh, <coughs> protein, this polymer, then it uh, folds into a very special uh, structure. And this very special structure is required for uh, the physiological function of that protein. So if it doesn't fold properly, then uh, the protein doesn't function, doesn't do what it is supposed to do. And in reality, one finds that this process happens uh, with probability in, uh, very close to one uh, for uh, the proteins that are found in uh, in nature. So uh, then since we are looking at a long polymer and the polymer is disordered in the sense that different segments of different amino acids, 
one can think of uh, this polymer as a random uh, heteropolymer. And then one tries to find out what are the configurations that will minimize its energy. And again, one finds, uh, if it's just a random copolymer, random heteropolymer, then one finds that the number of configurations that will minimize the energy is very huge. And then one would have the same problem, that how does the system find the true ground state? So this is a problem that has been sort of uh, bothering biologists for a very, very long time. That uh, since the, uh, one, one is looking at a polymer, which has randomness in the sense that uh, the uh, segments of the polymer, which correspond to different amino, amino acids, there is no regularity in that. <clears throat> but still, the, in reality, the protein can actually find its native state, which is the lowest energy state, in very short time, when it folds from starting from this high temperature unfolded state to the low temperature folded state. How does that happen? And this leads to, this has led to the uh, discussions about this potential energy landscape. Same thing as I was discussing earlier. This is the energy as a function of now we have different conformations of the, of the polymer. And if you had the picture that is similar to what you had in the glasses, then the protein would take an enormously long time to fold. But people have found that the surface is not like that. It has this funnel shape behavior that most of the initial states can actually uh, evolve into if not the lowest state, but states which are very close to it. So depending on the, this uh, potential energy landscape that you have in this particular case, the landscape is very different from what you have in glasses or spin glasses for natural proteins. If you have an atom heteropolymer, then you'll get something that looks like uh, the landscape that we found for glasses and spin glasses. But uh, for uh, the protein proteins that occur in nature, uh, the, they have this funnel shaped landscape, which makes it easier for the system to actually find the true ground state or uh, true folded native state. And that is why uh, naturally occurring proteins actually can uh, fold within a very short period of time. It doesn't require ages uh, to actually come to the ground state. <clears throat> so this is an example, 3D picture of this, this funnel. So again, you know, uh, the, the ideas or concepts that one gets from the studies of these random systems, they find applications to, in one case, a problem in community optimization, neural network, and things like that, and uh, the protein folding problem. And finally, I don't know anything about this, but uh, people are talking about this landscape also in the uh, in discussions about the string theory, where one finds that uh, appropriate variables, uh, <coughs> there are many, many such uh, minima, and one has to, many, many such vacuum states, vast area of vacuum states, and uh, one may have to take into account all these uh, vacuum states to understand uh, the properties that will eventually emerge from uh, the appropriate string theory. So this is all. Uh, these are just points that I thought I should emphasize at the very end, that uh, uh, <clears throat> these glassy systems or disordered systems, there are many interesting problems that uh, require uh, going beyond the ideas or concepts or methods that one uses to study uh, pure systems. Uh, there are many questions that still are unanswered. It's an activity of research. And uh, the, what one learns from the study of these systems can be profitably uh, applied to other areas. That's the last two examples, two, three examples that I told you about tells you that uh, this landscape picture is now becoming very common, many different areas in which one is seeing these landscape pictures. And there, the, the things that one learns from studies of glasses and spin glasses have uh, people have found that those are very useful in addressing the corresponding problems in the different areas. So, okay, thank you. This is where I end and uh, we'll take questions. Um, thank you, sir, for your insightful talk. Now, before we move on to the question and answer session, I request our speaker, Dr. Das Gupta, to open out and bring forth the Physics Society's annual journal, ECHO 21. Okay, so then I go out of the presentation mode, I suppose. Yes, that's fine. Yeah. Just one second, I have to make some changes here. So now you can see me. So I hold this up. Is that what you want me to do? <laughs> Yes. OK, so I'm very happy to uh, inaugurate this uh, this uh, magazine. I have not, uh, it's been staying with me for the last two days, but I have not read it. So I'll read it only after it is officially inaugurated. So I'll read it with interest uh, today or tomorrow. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, so we are extremely grateful to sir and to Dr. Harish Kumar Yadav, our staff advisor, and all other faculty members and the Physics Society Council members for their support and guidance in bringing out this journal. I also take this opportunity to ask all the people present here to switch on their cameras for a GMeet screenshot of the final day of the event. Uh, also, sir, you're still presenting. No, I'm still presenting. Thank you. Now it's fine. I would request everyone to turn on their cameras. Yeah, it's done. Okay, now we'll move on to the question and answer session. So uh, as we have done yesterday, I will, uh, I will read out the questions and also in case anyone is not able to follow, I'll also post the questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Thank you. mechanism related to Meissner effect in superconductors. Okay, so I mean, this uh, analogy is in some sense uh, uh, not exact. I mean, you know, one is looking at in superconductors, one is dealing with this uh, ginzburg landau theory, which is uh, not a, a, a quantum field theory. <clears throat> but uh, this uh, uh, effect that uh, in the Ginsberg landau theory for a superconductor, you have this superconducting model parameter, which couples to a vector potential. And the vector potential, uh, this, this coupling is through some kind of a gauge invariant coupling. So one can say that uh, gauge field, uh, electromagnetic field is coupling to a matter field. Uh, now, if the superconductor is not ordered, uh, then uh, this uh, uh, electromagnetic field is the usual electromagnetic field, just like in, in an ordinary uh, metal, uh, when it is not superconducting, the electromagnetic field can penetrate, magnetic field can go inside the system. Uh, but uh, when the matter field orders, the superconducting order parameter is non-zero, then you can see that uh, this uh, coupling between the uh, superconducting order parameter and the gauge field uh, leads to a finite mass for the gauge field. That if I now uh, look at the part of the uh, free energy functional that it depends on uh, the vector potential uh, A, then it's a k squared a squared term is there, which is already there, uh, even at high temperatures. But then there is also a new term, which is just proportional to a squared, some constant multiplied by uh, a squared. And that constant is proportional to the square of the superconducting order parameter. So now if I look at this quantity, uh, and look at the inverse of this quantity to get correlation functions and then to get free transform, then I'll get uh, something which uh, falls off exponentially with uh, a length scale, which is determined by this mass charm. And so through this uh, ordering of the uh, condensation of the matter field, the gauge field is picking up a mass. So in that analogy, this is the analogy that one has uh, between this phenomenon and uh, uh, the Higgs mechanism, where again, uh, one one tries to understand how the gauge field actually picks up a finite mass. The Higgs boson or things like that. They will have, of course, large mass. There is also another thing, which is the uh, what I call the lumbu Stone mode. That also in a superconductor, if we work out the ginzburg landau theory, that also will pick up a mass. So this phenomena looks sort of 
similar to the mechanism that uh, one uses in this uh, or the, the, the basic uh, mechanism that one wants to understand uh, in the context of the six words. And the Bizarre effect is the uh, uh, effect of this finite mass of the electromagnetic field that uh, if I now uh, look at uh, its propagator, then in real space, it will have this exponential cutoff. And that is what uh, happens in Meissner uh, <clears throat> effect that the magnetic field falls off exponentially as one goes inside the superconductor. There's a length scale and that just comes from this mass. Are there any physical factors that affect the probability of a site being occupied or is it completely random? Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, I suppose you are talking about, let's say, this binary uh, problem where some sites are occupied by spins, some sites are vacant. So the question is, is this process uh, completely random? The choice of which sites are occupied by spins and which sites are, occupied, are not occupied, is this entirely random or there is some other, uh, other process that plays some role in that? Uh, <clears throat> generally, I mean, you know, that again depends on the sample preparation. So how, how does one prepare the sample? Typically, when you have a binary alloy, you mix the two elements, you go to very high temperatures when they're liquid. And uh, then, of course, the two components are mixed uh, very nicely. Uh, and then you cool it, and then you get some kind of a binary system. And uh, if this process of mixing is done at very high temperatures, uh, then typically the sites which are occupied, sites which are non-occupied, non those are chosen at random because there is no correlation, so to speak, or very little correlation in high temperature liquid state. <clears throat> Depending again on sample preparations, uh, if you cannot do that, that uh, the mixing is not done at a very high temperature where things get properly mixed, but there is some uh, problem in the mixing, then of course it's clustering in the sense that uh, there it is possible to have samples in which there are clusters of sites which are occupied or clusters of sites which are unoccupied. So the choice of which site is occupied and which site is non-occupied is not done entirely at random. Uh, there is something in the in the actual process of making that alloy that says that uh, if a particular site is occupied uh, by a spin, then there is a higher probability of its nearest neighbor sites being occupied and things like that. The models that I have looked at where is, is that uh, this variable that tells you about whether a site is occupied or not, that uh, is a random variable. And the probability associated with a particular configuration is the product the probabilities associated with individual sites, which basically says that uh, they are uncorrelated. The random variable that I have to decide whether this site is occupied or not, that doesn't have any correlation with a random variable that is uh, some other sites. But depending on the method of preparation, there could be some correlations in the sense that if there is clustering, then it's uh, more probable for uh, two such magnetic sites to be next to each other and, and things like that. But in theoretical modeling, one often looks at them as uh, independent random variables. And then the process of the, uh, the arrangement that you have of some sites occupied and some sites not occupied, that is uh, completely random. Uh, when talking about clusters, you mentioned about spanning clusters being possible only when the fraction of the magnetic site is sufficiently large. We can definitely say that for a distribution, the minimum fraction of magnetic sites after which the spanning clusters are possible is unique. Does this number have any relevance or significance? Uh, <clears throat> so let me just uh, you know, understand this. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, this percolation problem, which I didn't have time to go into in detail. But uh, it's a very interesting problem, actually, uh, that uh, you do precisely what I'm telling you about, that you have a lattice, and uh, then you go to a particular lattice site, and then uh, decide with probability p that the site is going to be occupied, and probability 1 minus p the site is going to be unoccupied. You can easily do on a computer, and uh, then you generate a particular configuration of occupied sites. And then uh, you can also try to find out whether these occupied sites form a spanning cluster or not. A spanning cluster, I mean that uh, uh, cluster that goes from one end of the sample to the other end uh, through these uh, pairs of occupied sites, which are nearest neighbors. Now, you can do this you know, 10,000 times. What we'll find is that there is a uh, special value of P such that uh, the probability of having a spanning cluster uh, basically 
when when p is very small, then of course it's always equal to zero. As you are increasing p and then looking at the probability of having a spanning cluster as a function of p, then it will rise uh, uh, quickly near a, a particular value of p, and then eventually it will go to one. So if almost all the sites are occupied, then you always have a spanning cluster. So the two ends are, uh, are, are are trivial in some sense, but as you change p, then you go from uh, zero probability of having a spanning cluster to probability one of having a spanning cluster, and this rise basically happens uh, at near a, a characteristic value of uh, uh, this, this occupation probability of p. Now, there is a, from that, I mean, it still is a continuous curve. So from that, you cannot uh, determine a critical value of p. What happens is that as you go to bigger and bigger systems, then this growth from 0 to 1 appears more and more sharply. And in the infinite system limit, one can show, I mean, of course, I mean, this is all taking the limit. I mean, infinite system, you cannot uh, do on a computer, but you can study how this thing changes as you change the number of uh, sites that you have in your system. And in a very large system size limit, this uh, change from 0 to 1 occurs basically like a step function. That there is a particular value of p, which depends on the lattice that you are looking at, that below that value, the probability of having a spanning cluster is, is essentially zero, and above that value, uh, it, it's essentially one. So then we can define, so for each lattice, one can actually associate such a number. And this number, sometimes one can calculate exactly also for some lattices, uh, <clears throat> that below that, uh, if the occupation probability is below that number, then you will not have any uh, spanning cluster, but occupation probability is higher than that number, then with probability one, you will have a spanning cluster. So that number is actually very uh, well defined, but this is well defined only in the limit of very large system size. Hello. I think we have a last question. Uh, I've posted it also. Uh, when oh. talk about frustration, you mentioned that there are a large number of low energy states. And hence, it takes a lot of time to move from one energy state to another, which gives rise to slow dynamics. Is there any specific reason for the transition between two states to be slow? Yeah, so that, of course, depends on the details of the system. And uh, the question is, I mean, you know, when you're talking about these two states, we are, we are not talking about the state of a particular spin. We are talking about the state of the whole system, a spin configuration. So, of course, I mean, you have a very large number of spins. Uh, and these two states that I'll be talking about uh, in this con specific context is where the uh, orientations of the spins in one uh, of this configuration is very different from the orientation of the spins in the other configuration. So sort of similar to what I was talking about, the spirals argument, when, uh, of course, there are only two. Uh, so just let me just explain this a little bit. So in the ferromagnetic model, where uh, we don't have this complication of many, many uh, local minima, but we have two local minima, or two global minima. One is where all the spins are pointing up and where all the spins are pointing down. In going from this to that, the argument was that you have to create a domain wall. Uh, and uh, the energy associated with this domain wall state becomes very large when you have a very large number of spins. So that was the main reason why the actual system uh, does not explore both this minima uh, simultaneously uh, at low temperatures. So here also a similar kind of argument can be made that uh, although domain wall is not so easily defined here because the states that we're looking at are not all up or all down, but they're a mixture of some spins up, some spins down. But if uh, looking at two configurations uh, of such, uh, which have this property, that it is, each of these configurations has a certain number of roughly half of the spins pointing up and half of the spins pointing down. And there is another configuration, again, which has the half of the spins pointing up and half of the spins pointing down. But as you go from one configuration to another, you have to flip, again, uh, of the order of uh, the same system size, the number of spins. Then one expects that there, if you want to, the system wants to make a transition from the first one to the second one, then you would have to go through some kind of uh, a domain wall state, uh, which will have a very high energy. And uh, since the probability of making such a transition is exponential minus the barrier height divided by temperature. So if the barrier height is uh, very large, uh, then of course, uh, these transitions will occur with uh, very, uh, the rate at which this transition will occur will be very small. And that would give to that that would give rise to uh, this slow dynamics that we are talking about. 
So essentially, the two states that I'm talking about are not close to each other in this phase space. They are very far away from each other. And then in general, one expects that if one wants to go from one of these states to the other one, then you, the system would have to go through an intermediate state, which will have uh, high energy. And that, I mean, you know, one can also see that, let's say, in a computer where you where you look at uh, this different minima and then try to find out how one can go from one minimum to another. And then one finds that the intermediate state will have uh, high barrier. And uh, that is why uh, the dynamics becomes very slow in low temperatures. OK, thank you, sir. It seems the questions have been done. Can I ask a question? I have a question. Uh, yes, if this, this time, uh, yeah. uh, if you, uh, okay. Um, so you know, you mentioned this uh, protein folding problem that mm -hmm. um, the real uh, proteins, which are actually there in uh, living organisms, mm -hmm. um, they fold well and they have this funnel-shaped um, uh, architecture of their uh, energy landscape. They seem to be having that kind of a special character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had chosen a random uh, sequence of amino acids, a uh, random um, uh, polymer, uh, that would have had um, uh, presumably the kind of uh, uh, glassy, um, yeah, uh, uh, in a rugged landscape, and uh, you know would would not have found uh, uh, its uh, uh, its global minimum very easily. Mm -hmm. Is it um, known um, what feature uh, of uh, of the real proteins? I mean, is there, there must be something in the sequence, or there must, there must be something in the you know local interactions yeah. between between the various subparts of that um, mm -hmm. uh, thing uh, that enable um, uh, you know these things to get a smoother, uh, so to speak, mm -hmm. funnel shaped uh, you know landscape, which is conducive uh, to finding the native configuration. What, what, what exactly is, uh, is happening in those polymers? Uh, I don't think it is fully understood. I mean, people have looked at some aspects. For example, you know, this whole thing is happening in water. So this hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity, yeah. I mean, whether mm -hmm. yes. the amino acid segment that we're looking at that wants to be surrounded by water or wants to expel water from its neighborhood, uh, that seems to play an important role. Hmm. But so through the course, uh, yes. Uh, so you know, through the course of evolution, you know, presumably, you know, things have been selected, uh, fold well, uh, and uh, you know, you've selected evolution has selected sequences that uh, uh, that, that fold well. Right. But the physical property of uh, you know, given a sequence, uh, is there a way of uh, um, sort of figuring out that this will have a good uh, landscape? I mean, are our methods developed well enough to to be able to? Uh, you know, tell you that uh, lands. Uh, you know, calculate the landscape of uh, a particular sequence and so on, things like that. Or uh... Uh, I think uh, numerically finding the full landscape is is very difficult. But uh, this is actually a, a very sort of active research problem. So the, the, I just tell you, since you mentioned this problem, I just um, saw it in the news that uh, there is this. Uh, now people are using this uh, neural networks. Machine uh, learning, right? I mean, uh, there are these deep learning uh, deep techniques. Deep learning is doing very well. Uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, people have been able to actually. This is something that was done by some scientists in a place called DeepMind, which is an uh, uh, AI company, mm. and they were able to train networks uh, using existing data that you show you show the uh, amino acid sequence, and then the question is whether it falls well or not. So the input, input is the sequence, and the output is the binary number, zero or one, depending on whether it folds or not. And you change the network using the protein database. Mm -hmm. Show it 10,000 sequences, and for each you know whether the protein folds or not. And the network then, uh, on, in some sense, learns what are the characteristics of the original sequence that will lead to this zero or one. Hmm. Right. And then uh, the trained network can be given a new sequence, and then it will predict whether it's going to be zero or one. And then one can do the experiment to see it, whether it's actually false or not. Yes. And uh, the network apparently does very well. Mm. Yes, mm, right. And they don't know why it does well, right? Why it does well, because there are you know, millions of connections in the intermediate mm. layers, etc., that you have in the network. Right. So that is the problem with deep learning, that you, mm, you don't know why answer, it... but you don't know what led to the transfer. Yes. Mm. Right. Okay. 
Uh, thanks very much. It is a fascinating set of lectures. Uh, uh, Thank you. And, uh, you know, sort of very nice overview of the subject. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'm glad that you <laughs> took the time to listen to. No, me. I, you know, I I, I benefited <laughs> from, from attending. Yeah. Do the students know that you were uh, you studied at uh, Stephens? <laughs> I don't know. The students know. Student also old Popley Memorial speaker, and he is one of the most faithful attendees of the. Or the Pope Memorial Lectures. He's been there for every one of them, I think. I see, I see. So it's a Nivedita. They are always there. So thanks to them. Okay, very nice. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you always get good people to lecture. And <laughs> so it's a pleasure to attend. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope it was sort of at the right level. In the details I, I couldn't go into because it becomes too technical. But I guess in lecture like this, it's better to avoid all the technical stuff. Oh, yes, absolutely. I think, you know, I mean, uh, just enough to get, get the overview and just to get some physical intuition about what's happening. I think that that is very nice. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thanks a lot. Sir. Okay. okay. Thank you for the questions and also answering them. Uh, as you come to the end of our final day's lecture, at this occasion, I now request our staff advisor, Dr. Harish Kumar Yadav, to say a few words. Um, so uh, sir, I think you're muted. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, again, got muted. I think I have muted again. Yes, yeah, sorry. So, uh, Thank you and coming to the lectures. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, uh, students, uh, colleagues, and family members of uh, Dr. Popley, uh, who loved Dr. Popley very much, actually, uh, they started this uh, Popley Memorial Lecture Series in memory uh, of him. And uh, since then, actually, we are continuing uh, this lecture series every year without fail. And uh, the success of all these lecture series basically uh, is lies on basically the uh, the speakers actually who motivate our student and they are the driving force actually, which actually uh, present a very broad overview of their you know specialized area to our students, and our students are benefited uh, every time with these talks in selecting their future course of actions. So uh, I'm thankful, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Chandana Gupta, that uh, you actually accept our offer this year and you know delivered the 25th uh, Popley Memorial Lecture Series. And uh, special thanks uh, uh, here to uh, Professor Sanjay Jain, uh, Professor Nivedita, my colleagues, students, and uh, all the participants from external, uh, external to the college for attending these lectures and be a part of this 25th Popley Memorial Lecture Series. A special thank to uh, Mrs. Popley, uh, who was also here in all these three days uh, of, the, of the lecture series. Uh, 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 in the past, she usually come actually uh, uh, physically to the college uh, on the day of the inaugurations uh, of these Popley Memorial Lecture Series, but she has moved out to Bangalore, I think a couple of years back, and since then, she was not able to join the lectures. But this time, since this is online because of the reasons, you know, being obvious to us, she able to at least join the lecture series and uh, she's with us. Thank you, ma'am, for joining the lecture series. Now, uh, special thanks to, uh, to all my students, actually, uh, uh, of the Physics Society, president, vice presidents. Uh, if I name them, uh, uh, Neelam, uh, Binayak, Mehak, Andrea, Avneet, Ruel, Dhruv, Neil, Swapnila, Shalika, Varun, Jagriti, Paul, Dhruv, and Aklanta. They worked really very hard uh, in uh, organizing this event. And also, uh, Professor, you will get to know that uh, the eco uh, general that we have this time is very dynamic. 
and it is uh, it has uh, lots of research paper also student actually has presented or they are working on some like this thing so they really worked very hard uh, and my congratulations and my thanks to all the executive as well as non executive members of the of the physics society for making this 25th popley memory lecture series a success okay i am again thankful to all the audience who came here today and uh, the previous two days for attending these lectures so uh, in the end i'll thank all you again for making this uh, lecture series a success uh, thank you thanks all thank you professor kumar gupta for attending uh, for actually accepting our offer and making this lecture series Thank you very much. It was a nice experience. Sir. I'm Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, okay. sir. Thank you, sir, for your insightful talk. Now, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Wait. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thank you, sir, for your warm words. Now, with that, we have ended uh, the uh, today's final lecture series. So, thank you. Okay. Thank so you, Professor Chandra Gupta. Thank you, Professor Jain. Thank you. Thanks very much. Nice to see you, uh, Sanjay. Bye bye. Thanks, thanks, sir. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Say hi to Sudeshna. Ah, yes. Uh, we saw in the back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Bye now. Sign off.